Uh, Natalie, welcome to the show. Thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Daryl. It's great to be here. Um, so uh, to kick off our interviews, uh, we usually like to pass it over to you. For anybody that may not know who you are um, in the world of bulls, um, give us an idea of, of who Natalie is. Well, that's a tough one. I'm not sure I'll be able to answer that in two minutes, but um, very complicated, of course. Um, so, yeah, my name is Natalie. Um, I've been playing bowl since I was nine years old. So um, I'm 32 now. Yeah, um, you tend to forget, don't you, as, as the <laughs> age uh, ticks over. Um, so, yeah, I've been playing bowls, obviously, for a huge part of my life. And, you know, I've been incredibly lucky to be able to travel with it and meet some amazing people along the way from, from all over the world. Um, I've obviously been very 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 fortunate to have played in in a few commonwealth games as well um, and world championships which is has been an amazing experience and um yeah it's it's a fantastic sport that i think is very undervalued actually certainly in this country and, and probably in in others as well um you know obviously seen as an older person sport so and, and you know even now 23 years on i'm still a little bit embarrassed about playing bowls which is is really sad um i think uh, you know, less so than when I was a teenager, for sure. I was never told anybody. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's a funny old sport, isn't it? You obviously know it, know it well as well, and, and the listeners do too. But um, yeah, I, I, for my sins, I love it. <laughs> I'm filling a, a couple of gaps here. We've got um, a bronze at the 2012 World Bowl Championships, uh, one gold and two silver at uh, Commonwealth Games. Five gold uh, British Isles Championships, and uh, just recently, obviously named to the uh, 2022 Commonwealth Games team in uh, Birmingham. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's weird seeing it in a list. You, yeah, you kind of, yeah, it's, it's weird. <laughs> um, so you, you touched on it. You've been bowling since you were uh, the age of nine, roughly 23 years uh, in the sport. Yeah. Um, Early on, I mean, uh, a, a big victory came re really early on in your career. Uh, I think it was the age of 21 uh, when you won in Delhi. And it just, I, w I don't want to say you hit the scene, but uh, outside of England, probably everybody just said, holy smokes, uh, who is this person? Oh, 100%, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> at what point did you early on realize that you were not only just really good at the sport, but that you could probably play with um, some of the best players in the world? Um, yeah, it's, it's it's kind of an interesting question because it's it's actually quite hard to pinpoint, I suppose. And you know, I've always been, I guess, a pretty confident individual, and um, not necessarily just in bowls, but you know, just just day to day, I kind of have self belief and you know, back myself to to have a go at anything really. And um, yeah, obviously went to Delhi and nobody knew who I was and. I, I'll never ever forget actually that um, at the time Gail Jilks who was um, the ladies team manager had said that quite a well-known commentator in the sport had made a comment to her that um, England must be desperate if they'd picked me for the singles <laughs> wow. um, and I was like oh that's a bit mean isn't it yeah um, but this is obviously before before you know everything happened and um to be honest, I think, I, you know, I just felt so lucky to be there. You know, it was my first major event and, um, out, you know, outside of obviously playing in kind of British Isles tournaments at home. And I honestly just thought if I can get through the group stages, like that is my goal. You know, that's going to be amazing. Just not to embarrass myself, you know, on the world stage, really. Um you know that that obviously happened and i was like oh thank god you know phew it's you know i've not i've not been embarrassing and um you know then i kind of got into the quarterfinals and and played wales and, and obviously won that one and then i kind of think i was like oh you know this is going quite well actually um <laughs> but it was just so unexpected um and and then I played um, CT from Malaysia, who obviously I think had won the past two gold medals in the singles in a semi-final. And, you know, I think I was just kind of in this just amazing kind of headspace of, you know, let's see what happens, you know, give it my best. And whatever happens, you know, I've really enjoyed it and it's been an incredible experience. And I was just, I had nothing to lose, to be honest, because it was my first games. No one expected anything. Um, and I think when when I, you know, managed to kind of scrape through that game somehow, um, I think then I was like, 
crap like <laughs> I've got a medal you know whatever happens in the final like I've got a medal which you know even to this day like I still kind of um I get a bit emotional about it I think because it was just such an incredible time and I had you know quite a few family members that have been really lucky that they'd kind of been able to come out and support me and I know there's a photo, you know, of um, me like hugging my like mum and dad and brother and a couple of my cousins and an auntie made out there as well. So <laughs> it was just such a whirlwind. And um, yeah, I was on cloud nine for quite a long time after that. But I think really it was, yeah, it's probably that kind of semi-final game where I honestly thought like I deserve to be here. Um, I don't think I'd really felt like that before then because I just felt like I'd, you know, got a bit lucky maybe to get there and had had a few, you know, a few good games. And then I was like, oh, God, yeah, um, this is this is real. <laughs> I need to start putting my finger out a bit. Yeah. Um, speaking about Delhi and um, uh, and then subsequently after that, Glasgow, um, you went a gold in Delhi, you have two silver in Glasgow and just by the narrowest of margins um, uh, in those games. Um, I f During my research, I, I found a paper that you wrote from uh, 2012, um, which outlined pretty much all the stuff that you did. And it was um, incredible to read all the preparation, the stuff that went into it, um, where yeah. you played, how you played, trying to get used to not only Delhi, but then Glasgow. Um, what was your preparation like uh, leading into those two games? So I think um, in 2010 for Delhi, we, I think I um, would probably be correct in saying that I think we probably had the biggest budget like we've ever had or even since have had for a Commonwealth Games. Um, so, you know, the reality is that money wins medals. You know, if you've got good people, you know, good natural ability, then, you know, the reality is if you've got money to kind of prepare them as best as possible and, and have lots of high level competition, you know, training around the world, then that, that, you know, that's the best, best opportunity you can obviously ever get. So yeah, we were really lucky in Delhi to have that. And we had, um, we went over to Delhi before the games and had, you know, a tournament there and some training with a few other teams. Um, we went to the Australian Open. We went out to Spain for, for an event and had, you know, some competition there. Um, and we had, you know, quite a lot of stuff obviously at home as well. And I think it was just the exposure to regular, high level competition and you can't replicate that you know you can't replicate that when you're just playing against yourselves or you're playing against you know other players in in your country or your area um you can't get yourself into that headspace so i think it's very difficult um, unless you're actually in that situation so so yeah for delhi for sure you know we're on brand new greens no one had ever played on them they'd literally just been built so it's not like those greens were like anything else anyone had really ever played on and, and probably ever have since um so yeah we were just very fortunate i think to have that you know to have that budget to to kind of back up our our extensive training program and i actually i was in university at the time and i deferred my last year of university to focus on the games um and, um, you know, that meant that obviously I had no problem traipsing around the world, um, playing bowls whenever, you know, whenever I needed to. And I did some traveling in Australia, I spent a few months there before the Aussie Open and, and obviously got acclimatized to the greens a bit. Um, so, yeah, it was it was a once in a lifetime opportunity to kind of have all of that preparation. Um, and in a time in my life where I had no other commitments Um so yeah, I, I went back to university obviously the, the year after to, to finish my degree. But yeah, we were, I, I mean, I'd never be able to do that again. You know, if we got that sort of budget, still being amateur players, there's no way that I'd be able to take 10 weeks off work, you know, to, to fly around the world and play. But obviously at that, that time it was possible. Um, and then, you know, the reality is Glasgow, um, we had significantly less money, but we we're on our home greens. You know, I know it wasn't obviously in England, but the greens obviously in Scotland are, you know, identical. Um, so we were able to play on those in some test events. And to be honest, it was just as good practice to obviously play, you know, play on the on the greens at home as well. Um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, tactically, obviously, we could play the same game and um, we got to spend quite a lot of time together as a team as well prior to, the, to those games. And I think Glasgow was... I think one of the only games, I don't know if it's the only, but we all medalled in Glasgow, which I'm not sure has kind of ever happened before and certainly not since. So, um, you know, it just goes to show, I think, what 
what you have as a home advantage really so fast forward to today and you're getting ready to not only come out of a pandemic situation where people were locked down and, and not a lot was going on but yeah. you're married you have a beautiful daughter um you're working um what's the preparation like um going into the 2022 games i mean obviously you know we've not perhaps had as long to prepare as I think, you know, John McGuinness, our high performance manager, perhaps would have planned. Obviously, you know, two years ago, th there was no bowls at all. <coughs> Excuse me. So we all had a season off, um, which actually, you know, looking back in, in hindsight, actually, my Jamie and I were both very fortunate. You know, we just had Eliza and actually we got to spend so much more time with her than we ever, ever would have done if it hadn't have been for the pandemic. And I don't think either of us um, feel that not bowling that that summer was a negative, to be honest. And um, we, we very much enjoyed the break. Um, but, you know, it, I think everybody kind of came back to, to bowls last year with a sort of renewed sense of, uh, you know, desire and will to win and, and looking forward to kind of being out in the fresh air again and, and being competitive. Um, you know, I think you obviously... Yeah, you, you realise what you miss, don't you, when, um, you know, this, especially the social side is taken away because I think, you know, it's human nature, very base level. We all have a desire to socialise and be around other people. And, you know, bowls for a lot of players is how, you know, how we socialise. And I've got some great friends and, and, you know, people that I would have, I went from seeing kind of two or three times a week in the summer to not seeing for months. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was obviously very odd, but I think, you know, we, so we had some, you know, we had had quite a lot of training camps last last summer with with the squad, um, which then was a squad of eight. Obviously, before it was um, cut down to the final team of five, and um, and this year we've got um, we've actually got a team building weekend next weekend in London, which is not bowls related. Um, so that's just going to be great to to spend some time together and, and have a yeah have a bit of fun, hopefully. Um, and then yeah, I think in May. Uh, kind of kicks off our, our sort of official playing program um, and I think pretty much every other weekend we've got training camps um, whether it be sort of um, with against regional teams or we've got some tri-nations events I know Australia are coming over in May and um, we've got something in June I think with with the home nations as well so um, it's going to be pretty busy um, I'm trying not to think about it too much, <laughs> but obviously having a daughter, I can't, neither of Jamie or I can just sort of pop off for the weekend. We obviously have to have to make plans, but um, yeah, it's, it's going to be good. And I think, you know, we're really looking forward to getting back out on the greens and, and playing at that high level again, to be honest. Uh, you mentioned something that um, I also feel as well. Um, when everything kind of came to a halt and balls was put aside, um, I finally realized just how much time was being put into bowling <laughs> yeah. weekends, whatever. Yeah. Um, it was really nice to have the break. Um, yeah. When you finally um, picked up a bowl again and um, thought about playing, um, did you feel like renewed or, or just um, energized to actually just get right back out there and, and compete again? Um, in all honesty, um, I would be lying if I said I could be bothered before I played, you know, I honestly thought, do I, do I really want this? Yeah, exactly like you, you know, do I want to give up on my weekends and my evenings and, um, you know, working during the week, you know, weekends are the time that you get as a family. And, you know, did I, I'd obviously had such, we did both had such a lovely time having Eliza and, and getting all that time with her. And, you know, I was like, oh, oh, you know, I don't, I don't know. There was a lot of groaning in our house, I think, um, you know, do we really want to do it? But honestly, I remember vividly, we, we, had a, a, a team sort of training camp um, in Oxford really early in the season last year and I just loved it you know getting back out there and I said to, I remember saying to Jamie afterwards like that has made me realize how much I still want it and it wasn't really until I actually got back on the green and, and kind of got into that competitive mindset again that I realized how much I'd missed it um yeah perfect answer yeah uh, <laughs> um so what were your feelings uh, about actually being selected to the Commonwealth Games on home soil? Oh, I mean, if obviously we our sort of um, team selection was delayed a bit um, and, you know, we were all kind of waiting with 
bated breath for what felt like years, <laughs> you know, to, to find out, obviously it wasn't, but, um, you know, to find out whether or not we, we'd been selected. And I think, um, you know, when we eventually found out, um, it was just, you know, you kind of feel really you know in, in the first place that you know that wait is over because it's such an emotional roller coaster when you're going through a selection process because you know you give up so much time and you and mentally it's really tough because you're thinking it's on your mind a lot um you know and as much as you try and kind of get on with other things and and not think about it you just can't really help it and i think particularly for jamie and i where obviously there was a there was a chance that we were both going to be selected you know what impact that has on our family life as well is very unique um and as much as we don't want to be treated differently like we are in a very different situation from everyone else in the squad um you know in terms of our ability just to be able to pick up and go um so you know it's obviously a huge thing for our family to to both be selected so it was yeah it was just it was amazing and i think it's such a, a great opportunity to have a games you know at leamington spa where you know we're all really familiar with um and you know we'll be able to have eliza there with us and all our family um you know they they'll hopefully all be able to be there and it it's potentially a once in a lifetime opportunity um, you know, to play on on our own greens, um, you know, at a time in our bowling careers where, um, you know, we're still performing, you know, performing at a decent level and feel confident that, you know, we can put everything into it and, and yeah, try and aim high, I suppose. Um, question about the team. There's 18 members and seven are from Devon. Is there something about Devon that uh, people don't know about bowls? <laughs> Um, I mean, we've been asked this a lot and um, I don't think I've really quite nailed the, the perfect answer yet. But I mean, we've got um, there's obviously, you know, Jamie is from Norfolk originally, so he very much is still a Norfolk boy and, you know, Norfolk till he dies. Um, he's, he's not a Devon boy. Um, and then Louis was from Somerset originally, but, but moved down here with his wife, Kelly, um, with his parents, actually. Uh, they, they moved down here. So, um, but yeah, I mean, obviously there's, you know, myself and Sam and Soph and then Alison in the, in the VI team as well. So, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I think we, you know, we always had any when we were younger and perhaps not so much anymore, which is really sad, but we had kind of a great pathway when we first started bowling. So Sam and I pretty much started at the same time. I think he was maybe a bit before, before me, um, but he's been playing for, you know, well over 20 years as well. And um, my brother played, who was the same age as Sophie. And, you know, we've we've all grown up together and we had a, an amazing junior section at our local indoor green when we first started and, and were exposed to a lot of coaching and, you know, a lot of opportunities from quite a young age. Um, you know, at one point, I think there was something like 65 juniors that used to go, you know, every Saturday morning. Um, so I think that was massive. And actually a lot of the players in the England team and, you know, in the county team from for Devon actually were part of that kind of junior programme. Um, so yeah it's it's hard to tell it really is but i think yeah we've got we've got a lot of greens we've got a lot of bowlers you know we always have really high levels of entries for our competitions so you know in order to be successful and get recognized you have to be beating really competent players at a local level um so i think it's just meant that we've obviously had to play play very well to be recognized from from the beginning to be honest fair um so going back to the, the calm games in 2010 and 2014 um england had tremendous success uh 2018 down in australia was um a, a bit of a down year what's the expectation yeah. um for for england this year is it um you know obviously gold is the goal um the standard that's that's what you want to go for but um are, yeah. is the confidence high that uh, england's going to uh come out and have a bounce back year yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, you know, the reality is, is that we never get whenever we've played, you know, in um, Southern Hemisphere countries, we've never had enough time to really prepare. Um, and actually, you know, the green, the surfaces are so different. And I think tactically what shots you can play and how you can play them is very different to, to what we used to at home. So it's just a very different game. And, you know, obviously we, Bowls England, sort of select the um, teams for the Commonwealth Games, you know, from players who play on greens that are, and they're very good at playing at greens that are 12 seconds, you 
know, whereas we go over to, over to Australia and it might be 18 second greens, which, you know, are vastly different. Um, and it's not even like indoors, really. So it's not like you could suddenly go and pick all the best indoor players and, and do really well either. It's, it's So it's really tricky. But I think, um, you know, we've got such a strong squad this year. You know, we've got, you know, so many experienced players that have obviously, I think, pretty much everyone bar Nicky has obviously played um you know played at games before and obviously he you know he's a born winner um you know obviously his, his success at Potters in the world championships over the years has, has proven that and I think whilst it's his first games um you know no one's going to doubt that if you get you know if you get him into the important games he's going to deliver so uh I've actually um we've talked to some players from Australia as well and uh it almost uh, mirrors exactly what you said when they say they go to the northern hemisphere um it's a struggle as well because their greens are not yeah. like that they don't know how to play the shot selection is very different um so it's yeah. not surprising that it's the opposite uh for you guys as well no well it's good it's good to hear it from them they are human yeah <laughs> <laughs> very true um <clears throat> well, one surprise uh that, that came up during um i guess pre-selection into the selection um that'll be missed from the women's side is uh, Ellen Faulkner. She uh, retired, yeah. took a position down in Australia and is down there. Uh, we've seen a number of fairly high profile bowlers either um, take new positions or retire like Karen Murphy and Joe Edwards, uh, just to name a yeah. few. Um, what has the impact of Ellen uh, not being on the team had uh, for you guys? I mean, you know, Ellen, Ellen and Chris are great friends of ours. And I think, you know, this, this move has been something that they've been hoping to, you know, they'd hope to do for a number of years. And, um, you know, from a personal level, we obviously miss them terribly um, because they're great friends, but, you know, we're still in touch and it was just, it was too good an opportunity for them to pass, you know, pass up. And it wasn't a bowls decision. It was a lifestyle decision. And, and obviously, you know, they've both got great jobs there and, um, you know, yeah they'll they'll do amazingly well um and we're very jealous of them sunning themselves now whilst we've had storm Eunice over here and yeah roofs are blowing off um but i think from you know from a bowls perspective um you know ellen's been an integral part of high performance bowls england since you know 2002 which was obviously her first commonwealth games and you know she's clearly one of the most successful female bowlers you know we've ever had in this country and she's su she's just such a steady influence um you know you know you can rely on her she's she's just a lovely person um and a, you know an amazing friend and a great bowler she's very loyal um you know you know that you can yeah rely on her under tough situations she never loses her head and um you know she's so experienced um so from that perspective, it was a huge, you know, a huge loss for the team. But I think what it has allowed for is, you know, for someone else to be, you know, involved in the selection process and, you know, and, and be given an opportunity that perhaps wouldn't have. Um, and actually, I, I think, you know, our team is not... I don't think our team is necessarily worse off for it in terms of what our performance will be on the green um, because we've got enough time to obviously prepare, you know, prepare as a, a unit now. Um, but, you know, at the time, obviously, you know, you would have had her on the team sheet, you know, easily. And I think it just, um, you know, it was just a bit of a shock for everybody that obviously she wasn't, wasn't able to be involved. But, um, you know, I think we've, we've got, so much experience in our team i mean obviously amy has come along that journey with ellen and, and has played had obviously a, a couple of games break but that was personal choice she certainly would have been selected i'm sure if, if she'd made herself available um obviously myself sean and jamie lee have uh, played in the game since 2010 and, and so has been involved since glasgow so you know it's not like we've um we suddenly got someone who's very inexperienced you know in, in the squad we've we're obviously very fortunate to, to have real strength and depth in our squad um so yeah it's it was obviously a very sad moment for us all but i think um um, you know, it's, it's yeah, given us opportunities to kind of look at, at what comes next and, and what we do moving forward as a team. Awesome. Um, I was when I was researching for this interview, um, looking at the uh, Bulls England national titles, and in multiple disciplines, your name is peppered through uh, everything, either winning it or runner-up. Um, how difficult is it? 
to not only make the England Nationals, but um, hit the final uh, so many times? Um, it, you know, it takes a lot of commitment, I think, because, you know, you're playing, we're, we're in a big county, so, you know, often even to get out of Devon, um, you know, the county that we live in, we might be playing, um, you know, four or five games to get out of our section, and then you have like another three or four to get out of the county, and that's before you, you know, even get to the national final. So, um, but I think that always sets us up very well, you know, if we can actually get out of our county, um, then, you know, it sometimes isn't actually any harder at the finals um, because we've played some, you know, incredible players along the way to get there. Um, you know, just in our club, we've got, you know, multiple um, England international players. Um, so, yeah, sometimes just, you know, I'm looking at the draws for this summer, you know, some of my first rounds are against people that I play in the England team with. Um, so, um, so, you know, that certainly doesn't make it any easier. But, um, you know, we're very fortunate at our club, um, Kings in Torquay, to have, you know, some really amazing players which means that obviously in the team events we're we're really strong um and uh, you know we've we've obviously been lucky enough um to to be, be able to qualify um you know qualify for competitions and then and manage to sneak a few titles as well but it's you know you you can't take any of these things for granted and i think particularly in outdoor bowls um you know quite often you're beaten by the green aren't you so you know there's never a, a sort of this the, well i mean sometimes there might be an on paper winner but it, it quite often doesn't go like that and i think um you know often you are playing against the green as much as you are the opposition so so, uh, which sometimes can obviously um, lead to results that perhaps weren't expected. So, you know, every time you are able to to win one of those titles, you just, yeah, thank, thank the Lord that you managed to find it on that day, really. <laughs> so um, both you and your husband, Jamie, are highly decorated. Um, just recently, um, Jamie took down another uh, World Bulls uh, tour title. Um one place that uh, on the national listing that I didn't see your name was the mixed pairs. Do you and Jamie ever play together? <laughs> um, so yes, we have done. Um, so once, yes. <laughs> one, one, the first, I think it was probably the, the first year Jamie moved down to Devon actually. And we thought it'd be a lovely idea, you know, to play in the mixed competitions together. And, um, I think if I'm correct in thinking, we did get to the quarterfinals and um, really we valued our marriage more than the title. So we, we decided that whilst it, you know, was a lovely idea, the reality of it perhaps wasn't for us. Yeah. <laughs> so bravo to any married couples that do play because, yeah. That's a brilliant um, it, answer. It's not for us. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I'm not I'm not surprised by that. Um, a lot of the married couples that I see play... Um, Either it's a struggle or they're really, really good together. Um, there's really no middle ground sometimes. So. <laughs> no, no, no. We, um, I think you're just too honest with each other. You know, there's so many things that you would never ever say to, you know, someone you play with normally or a friend that you play with that you definitely would say to your your partner. And um, yeah, it was it was unpleasant. There was many a silent car journey on the way home after a game. <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> So switching gears, uh, I, I noticed uh, some videos um, that you had online uh, advocating for more women uh, in sport and more women in, in lawn bowls. Um, lots of previous interviews uh, trying to break the stereotype of the old person game versus um, you know young people being in the sport. Um, so you seem to be uh, really... Uh, over your career trying to push uh, the fact that bulls is for everybody is inclusive it's accessible yeah. um you know don't just think of it as you know older people dressed in white uh you know yeah. having a, a stroll out on the green um what do you personally feel um needs to happen to uh, raise the profile of bulls and and get more i won't say necessarily just younger people but just more people in general involved in the sport um i think you know so many, you know, on so many occasions, if you're involved in a sort of kind of open day down at your local club or, um, you know, you're, you're advertising the sport, you know that as soon as you get people on the green actually giving it a go, I've never, ever, ever in my, you know, life of getting new people on the green ever heard anyone say that was really rubbish. 
after they've had a go you know it's always the total opposite like oh god that's so much more fun than I thought or so much harder than I thought it would be and you know so I think if if we can find a, a way just to get people on the green really you know I think everything else after that kind of should be fairly easy because we all know you know we're all testament to that that once you start playing <laughs> you're absolutely hooked and yeah 23 years later i'm still you know still playing every day of the week in the summer um but i think it's just yeah it's just breaking down that that kind of um yeah stereotype perhaps that it's a slow boring game um and you know that that is going to take time because the reality is the majority of people that play bowls around the world are older people. You know, it's, it's a sport that younger people, it is a younger person sport, but it's a sport that older people can play and are able to, you know, physically, perhaps they, they're not able to pursue the sports that they used to competitively when they were younger. So they turn to bowls because they still are competitive, but uh, yeah, not able to play hockey anymore or basketball, or whatever, you know, it might be football. Um, and, and actually, you know, we've got thousands of bowls greens in our country and, you know, you can bet a lot of money that you go down to your local bowls green and there will be someone playing in, you know, brown shoes and, and full white gear and a tie. Um, and, it, you know, it is slowly changing. Um and I think it's, you know, it's changing for the better with, you know, colourful uniforms. And, you know, I think it has to start at the, at the grassroots level, um, you know, from the the perception side of things. Um, and, and also, I think, it, the, you know, there's a lot of onus on the national governing bodies to, to create, you know, marketing campaigns, which do break those barriers down, really. Um, you know, it, it very much is a kind of white middle class sport. Um, and, and actually, you do very, very rarely see any sort of ethnic minorities playing, um, you know, it, it often is yeah just just white people and i think it's it's such a shame because actually it is such an amazing sport that can bring so many communities together and it's so irrelevant you know where you're from what religion you are what your background is you know sport does bring people together and it's and that's not just bowls i think it goes across the board and i i just think for so long now there's been you know wasted opportunities really with with our game and um you know the commonwealth games is is really the only time every four years that anyone else who doesn't play bowls actually gives a crap about our sport um you know so we really do have to make the most of, of the opportunity when it comes around you know we we don't get this sort of multi multi-sport platform opportunity very often and um you know i just think it's it has been wasted in the past certainly in 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 great britain um and, you know, hopefully being a home games now, um, you know, we've got the opportunity to to really promote the sport to to non-bowlers. Um, you know, we know bowlers will be watching the common of games um you know but what we want is is people that perhaps have bought tickets to see something else maybe coming in and thinking oh what's this you know this looks really good and you've got you know people from all different age groups in some funky kit and you know it's loud and, and it looks exciting and i think that's you know that's the side of bowls that we want people to see we don't want them to see the you know the dowdy older people in their whites um you know very sedate um you know in the local village green um moaning you know that they can't bend down um so yeah i think there's no easy answer it's 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 i think it's it the, there is has to be a long game and i think really you know it has to it has to start with you know people that are in you know high performance teams or, or international teams because you know we have an opportunity and a voice to be heard um to promote the sport and i think we've all got so much out of it um you know you do have to give back um you know the reason i'm sat here today is because people volunteered you know at my local indoor green and, and taught me how to play um and I'm totally indebted to, to well, Peter Pryor's name was. And, you know, I, I know that I'm indebted to him because he, you know, taught me what, what I know now and, and was the foundation to my bowls career. So, you know, we've, we've, all of us have had support in some way or another over the years from volunteers in our sport and you know what little time spare time we do have you know in our, our busy personal lives i think it's important we we try to give back really well said uh very well said um <laughs> for those um that are looking up to you as a role model um uh probably a lot of female boulders in in england as well um trying to make the national team, looking at your success and saying, you know, I really want to do that. I want to travel. I want to uh, compete at the Commonwealth Games. 
Um, what kind of advice would you uh, give to them? I think where possible, you have to surround yourself with people that are better than you. Um, you know, I was really lucky early on in my career um, at the indoor green we played at, because that's where I started. Um, there was a lady called Cheryl Northall, and, you know, she'd won um, the World Champion of Champions and, and, you know, played for England for a number of years. And she kind of took me under her wing and played in a league with her. And I used to, like, polish everyone's bowls every end and line them up really neatly, um, because that's the sort of thing I was into when I was 10, um, you know. And, and I was just so I just was so lucky to be surrounded by people that were just far superior to me on the bowls green. And I learned so much from them. Um, you know, I think I actually manage our um, under 31 junior team now. Um, we've got, you know, we've kind of got like half our girls in our squad that are super competitive and already competing at a kind of county national level. And then you've got like the other half of girls where there's, there's so little pathway for them. And actually they're not, they don't have that desire. You know, they don't have the desire to win. They're not entering in the, you know, the junior competitions. They're not trying to play with people that are better than them and putting themselves in those positions where, you know, they're going to get better. Um, and I think, you know, from my experience, you know from how I kind of learned when I was younger I wanted you know, I wanted to play against people with people that were better than me because I wanted to get better myself you know I had that desire to learn and desire to win and you know the reality is I think if you don't have that um, it's not something you can teach um, but you know if, if you are really competitive and really keen to to get better then you know it does involve sacrifice and you know I think we were my brother and I were very lucky we had incredibly supportive parents who drove you know thousands of miles you know every year for us and getting up early on weekends and taking us to matches and you know I think it's very hard for young people to to be able to to play any sport really at a decent level unless you've got that support at home but you know if, if you do have that support and you know you're you're looking at you know England players and you know it's probably not not me you know other other women you know in our in our team um you know you have to if you want to be like that then you've got to surround yourself by yeah with people that that are really good players that you can learn from um and you have to be open to learning as well you know i think a lot of people don't perhaps take constructive criticism very well um it has to obviously be communicated in the right way and, and come from someone you respect but again you just have to surround yourself with with people you do respect and, and want to learn from really i think you made an excellent point there about um uh, being open to learn. Um, as a, a coach myself, there's there are times where people come to you and say, um, I want to be able to draw better, I want to learn um, or fix my delivery or whatever it is. Um, but they really don't want to hear anything. So uh, as much as they say they want to learn, they're not going to learn yeah. because they're just not open to it. So that's a really good point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, you touched on another point, um, that being family. We hear that a lot um, in our interviews, uh, especially of, of players that are really high up. Um, I see it in other sports as well, where, um, you know, behind every really, really good player uh, growing up, there's parents that drive, take time out, take them to practice, take them to yeah. tournaments, all that kind of stuff. Um, now that you've got a family of your own, um, how important is family to your overall career? Oh, I mean, there's absolutely no doubt in Jamie or I's mind that without the support of our families that we would both be able to compete. Like it just it's not physically possible. Um, you know, we're we're very, very fortunate in that respect. And my parents actually live sort of twenty minutes away from us and um, you know, we're absolutely indebted to to their kind of childcare support um you know to be able to play at this level and um jamie's family is still up in norfolk so they're sort of five hour drive away and you know i know um i know that they were they're so keen to help but obviously the distance makes it really tricky um but uh when when we we do compete in in leamington um they'll all be there um, you know, so they'll they'll all be getting their fair share of Eliza, <laughs> uh, toddler mayhem when um, when we're when we're playing in Leamington. But um, yeah, in terms of you know, our, we've got yeah, as I said, sort of every other weekend we're going to be you know playing in in something or other for the games, and then obviously you know alongside that we've got all of our county and national competitions to try and fit in around that as well. So it's um, yeah, it's gonna it is going to be a challenge and. I've only I've, I've kind of tried to avoid looking at my diary for the summer um, for as long as possible because I know it's going to be really hideous. Um, but I think you know we're, we're creeping into March now, and you know um, it, I need to start sort of yeah sorting things out really. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. 
Um, so my final question for you, uh, knowing that uh, uh, the 2022 games are, you know, the big ticket item on your calendar to say, here's where I want to be. I want to get gold, um, achieving for the best. Um, fast forward past that. Um, what are your goals for the future in your Bulls career? Um, do you have anything that you want to do? Um, that's a, you know, that's a really interesting question. I think, um, now we've got, now we've got Eliza, I think that has obviously, you know, as it does with any parent, I think really changed our perspective on, um, how we spend our our time really and i think you know we've given up a huge amount of time you know last summer and will do this summer to both have this opportunity to play so i think for sure with you know with something's going to have to give um you know after this summer i don't think it's going to be possible for us to kind of maintain for us to both maintain this this level of you know of playing so um you know that that's just the reality of the situation and i think um you know they she's two now and she's so much fun to be around and you know i know next summer's going to be you know different again and um you know we obviously both work as well so the the kind of thought that we could put ourselves and her and our families you know through this again um is is really tough i don't i don't think it's it's doable you know it's such a huge ask for our parents um to to have her you know and, and look after her on our behalf really as much as they they will be this year um so i think a break will probably be needed um after after this summer um and then what comes after that who knows really um you know we're both incredibly competitive people and um i don't think it's possible for us not to do not to play bowls um you know uh, because yeah we both really love it and for both of us it's a huge part of our social lives as well so you know it's it's very important but um honestly i yeah i i I don't know i think the commonwealth games obviously is the pinnacle of our sport so it's you know it's that's what we aim to and obviously i've been fortunate enough to you know for this to be um you know not not the first games i've played in um i've obviously i got a bronze in the world championships in in adelaide and i think um you know I'd, i'd love to do better um in the world championships um that that one's kind of been a bit of a bugbear for me really um that that i've i've not been able to do better than that but i think um yeah we'll just have to wait wait to see what happens you know every every year is a new year and um yeah who knows what's around the corner um so i lied uh (laughs) um talking about eliza uh i think i saw pictures of her out on the green rolling some bowls uh is there a a future lawn bowler in in your family if we have anything to do with it absolutely not no um she is going to be playing a money sport for sure um i think bowls is literally the last last option so with we're thinking you know neither of us are particularly tall so you know, netball's probably out to be honest, because we're yeah, neither of us are sort of six foot or even close. Um, so I have zero hand eye coordination, but somehow managed to play bowls at a decent level. Whereas Jamie actually is fairly sort of naturally good at most sports. So we sort of thought tennis, but that's unlikely. So we're, we're sort of gunning for hockey because that is a paid sport in this country. Um, Jamie was half decent at football, I think, when he was younger. So that there's possibilities there. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously we all support her in whatever sport she wants to do. But you know, we're we're hoping for nice nursing homes, to be honest. So um, you know, I think think hopefully she can she can play something that she makes a bit of money at. But really, you know, you just want your kids to to be happy and enjoy themselves, don't you? So no doubt, um, you know, she will be spending some time around the bowl screens. Uh, during her her childhood, um, so it may well put her off completely. Who knows? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so, Natalie, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure. You've been uh, a wonderful guest. Uh, obviously, um, we've seen your career for some time. Uh, seen you almost grow up in the sport, uh, so to speak. And um, on behalf of the Canadian Bowler and all the viewers, uh, just want to wish you all the, um, the best for 2022 and uh, the best of luck at the Com Games as well. 
thank you so much daryl it's honestly been a pleasure and um yeah hopefully hopefully um i'll be able to have an interview after the games that i've you know holding holding a nice shiny medal um but we will try our best and yeah thank thanks so much again for having me it's it's been great awesome thank you very much <laughs>